Well, welcome everybody. As you're joining today, we would love to hear where you are joining from. I am in Houston, Texas, where it's actually sunny today, Amy. We've had so much rain this summer. Where are you uh, joining us from today? I'm up in Minnesota and we are the opposite. We have had hardly any rain, but in a drought. So we actually have some storms rolling through today, which I'm pretty excited about. I wish I could give you all the rain. Just take it. <laughs> <laughs> the good news is it keeps the temperature lower, but, um, but yeah, it's just all of a sudden we'll have a downpour. So what a weird weather summer we've all had. But as you're joining, we'd love to hear from you. Put in the chat box there where you are joining from. I know we've got some leader team members that are joining that we're kind of, we've got a hybrid team. So we're based out of Dallas, but then have folks all across the country. And then I know Amy, your team is 100% um, remote all across the country as well. We are. It looks like Chip is joining from Baltimore. Don, hey Don, good to see you from Virginia Beach. Leanne from Colorado, so glad to have all of you with us. You are in for a treat. Just looking at Amy's notes, I've already learned so much. I can't wait for you guys to learn from Amy as well. We are going to be talking about how to lead a high impact team. And I think this, this couple words, high impact, is really important. We're going to unpack together what that even means. Um, hey, Randy, thanks for joining us. We got another um, upper Midwest from Wisconsin there, Amy. Oh, Wisconsin, <laughs> I love that. Hey, neighbor. That's awesome. And hey, Tiffany, so glad to see you. All right, well, I am, let's start with some introductions. Uh, I'm Holly Tate. I'm the Senior Vice President of Growth at Leader. And I've spent the last 10 years helping churches and ministries and values-based organizations with organizational structure regarding staffing. So I was at a company called Vanderblumen before I joined the leader team. And now at leader, I get to resource leaders at how to develop leaders at every uh, part of their organization. So we're a people development software and I love what I get to do in resourcing leaders all day, every day. And Amy, we've known each other for a few years now. Mm -hmm. um, we love the Unstuck Group at Leader. So could you tell everybody a little bit about your story and the Unstuck Group? Sure, I've been with Unstuck for about six years now. So I'm their director of consulting. I often joke that like the director part is my side hustle because really what I do each and every week is I'm on site with the church working through the Unstuck process where we assess health, help them with planning. And then the big part, Tali, that I know that we share is how do we now align our structure to where we believe God's calling us to go. So I love the local church, the power of the local church. I led in one in here in White Bear Lake, Minnesota for um, over a dozen years prior to joining the Unstuck group. So um, yeah, that, that's where I get to spend my time. And I spend a lot of time in the staffing and structure area. Uh, and you're so good at it because it's critical. It's not just about hiring the right person. It's about making sure that everybody's on the right seat on the bus and mm -hmm. moving in the same direction, which is a lot about what we're going to talk about today. So thank you so much for the time investment, Amy, to be in yeah. with us. We want to invite you guys, as you have questions, there's two ways you can drop your questions. One is in the Zoom chat feature, which I'm sure we're all used to using that by now. <laughs> um, and then there's also the Q&A module that's a part of Zoom. So you're welcome to drop your questions in either of those areas, and we'll make sure to get to those at the end. We're going to leave plenty of time for Q&A, so um, make sure you get those ready and drop them in for us. So today we're going to have a uh, focus on three specific areas. One is what is a high impact team? Why aren't we saying high performance? Why aren't we saying healthy? We're going to unpack what is a high impact team. And then Amy's going to walk us through six specific components of a high impact team. And then we're going to give you some practical next steps if you want to take this to the next level with your organization. And then of course, leave plenty of time for Q&A. So Amy, let's dive in. A big question that I can't wait to hear your thoughts on is what is a high impact team? Sure, how we've defined it, and this is, um, there's a great book out there written by Lance Witt who did a lot of the research into pulling this concept together. But we call a high impact team, one that is both healthy and high performing. So health is about things like your internal life, right? As a ministry leader, it's your rhythms, it's healthy relationships and infusing it's spiritual formation into the teams that you lead and the teams that you serve with. 
So we want to have a healthy soul. We want to be a healthy person. The other side is performance, right? High performing teams. It's about getting the work done. It's executing on your vision. It's about focus and bringing clarity to people's wins, empowering people, being a collaborative team. So a high performing team gets the results that they're focused on. They get them done. And so when we go hard after both of these, both health and high performance, that's where we have the synergy. And, and you do have to go hard after it because as Lance Witt often says, you never accidentally become a great team. That's so, so we, true. isn't it true? So mm -hmm. we just view health and performance when we pursue them, we actually close this gap between the vision that we believe God's called us to and the actual action that gets us there. So that, that's basically a high impact team. Yeah. And that's really powerful. It's not just about the vision of who do we want to be? So if we sit around and talk about that all day, we never get anything done. And so that's mm -hmm. where the action becomes so important. So I love that it's health plus performance mm -hmm. equals high impact. But here's the question that I bet a lot of people are asking Amy, which is, can you be both high impact and healthy? I think that's a tension a lot of leaders are really thinking about right now, especially with a lot of the trauma we've faced as a mm -hmm. culture in general over the last year and a half. So can you really yeah. be high impact and healthy at the same time? Yeah, definitely. There are teams out there that are high performing and they're healthy, but more often than not, we all, we often see them tipping to one side or the other, you know, for, for some teams, health is that their dominant skill, right? They're really healthy teams. And for them, I would say their key word there is relationship. They do relationship very well. And because of this, they find it easy to care for and encourage their teammates. And they often have like this strong sense of family or community on their team. But if we get too weighted just in health, the problem is people get along, they're polite, we shepherd one another well, but often priorities aren't clear, there's no real time coaching, we lack accountability on the team, you know, towards the performance measures. And dysfunction, honestly, is as relational as we are, it's actually where dysfunction isn't really directly dealt with because we might have caring conversations, but we don't have those courageous conversations that we need to have. And then the flip side I see is other teams are really weighted on the performance side. Performance comes easy for them. I would say this was true about the church that I worked at. We got things done, man. We were growing, we were expanding. You know, the key word for us and for teams like this is probably results. They, mm -hmm. they often are very achievement oriented. They're driven and often driven around the mission accomplishment more than driven around people. And then on these teams, you hear a lot about like goals and progress towards those goals. But again, teams that have too much imbalance towards just the high performing, um, you know, these are the ones they read a lot of leadership content. They have this aggressive vision, but they can often see people on their team in a very utilitarian way. Almost people are transactional for them in order to achieve what they want to do. I often see leaders in this space maybe get defensive when challenged and, um, I don't know if they intentionally do it, but they just overall there, we downplay the importance of spiritual and emotional health when mm. we're too weighted on performance. That's so true. We have a slide that we often uh, show our customers that leader, which is exactly what you're describing. It's the tug of war. It's literally, you know, people mm -hmm. tugging on both sides of the rope of executing the mission and the care and development of our people, because mm -hmm. it's so hard to balance those two things. So I just dropped in the chat, where do you tend to fall relationships or performance? It's really hard to balance both. You know, um, I, I definitely fall more to the performance side where, mm -hmm. cause I'm, a, you know, using personality tests, I'm a high D on the disc, love to get things done. And so I often have to put in accountability you know, metrics for myself of, am I slowing down? Am I caring for my team? Am I taking time to check in with them and ask them how they are rather than just, you know, bulldozing <laughs> over everybody. So it's right. Right. such a good reminder. I also really appreciate what you said, Amy, about relationships. So we have a saying here at leader that, um, organizations move at the speed of trust. I actually heard this from our CEO, Matt Tresseter first, and where does trust come from in the context of relationships? And you're so right that that is where um, trust comes from is, is relationships. And that is at the core of really being a healthy and high performance team. Mm -hmm. We have to have both to be, 
to be high impact. So that's awesome. <laughs> well, let's dive into unpacking these six components. You guys at Unstuck Group have created this awesome wheel that I love. It's just a really great way for us to um, visualize what a high impact team looks like. So we're going to go through each of these individually. So get your Apple notes or your Evernote, <laughs> or if you're a leader customer, get your leader tool out and take some notes. Um, but before we dive into each one individually, Amy, I would just love to hear where did this wheel come from? How did you guys land on these six components? Sure, I have to remember back a little bit, but this was triggered by our director of teams, which is Lance Witt, and he was writing a book around this whole concept of high impact teams. You know, he was the executive pastor at Saddleback for many years. And after he left that role, by the way, high performing team, right? They're probably healthy too, but I know that it was a high performing team by the results they got. Um, but afterwards, he really embraced this passion to go like, how do we do ministry without, you know, losing our soul, right? How do we not just have a profession of being a minister, but how do we actually make that our personal ministry as well? And so he launched a, a ministry called Replenish that really dove into the health side of things. And so, but he's wired for action as well. And so it was just in him to go, we need to create a resource, a tool that talks about how do we do both of these things? Cause it is the both end, it's not an either or. And so through um, a year or two, as he, he researched it, um, brought some of us into weigh in on it. This is where we really landed. And I give, you know, most of the credit here to Lance here, cause he pulled all this together. But these were the six areas we said, if we're gonna have a high impact team, these are the things that need to be working well in our organization. Yeah. And easy, right? I mean, so easy. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's so easy to look at a chart and be like, yeah, these six things. But as we mm -hmm. unpack each of them, this is hard work. And that's leadership, right? Is mm -hmm. unpacking each of these. So, all right, Amy, well, let's dive in. So the first one that we're going to talk about is personal health. Mm -hmm. So talk to us about what do you mean by personal health. And just for everybody that's um, that's watching today, I've got a question under each of these six components that we're going to walk through. Maybe you just jot it down uh, and, and think about this and really take some time to think about your answer to each of these questions so we can all be a better leader. So Amy, with that, talk to us about personal health. Yeah, personal health may be intuitive, but it's about having a vibrant and growing connection with God, you know, where your growth as a, disi a disciple of Jesus is a priority. And it's having genuine friendships, you know, community with others on your team. It's practicing spiritual disciplines. It's reading God's word. It's practicing Sabbath. It's taking care of oneself and embracing this healthy work and family rhythm. And so it's really what it says, personal health. And again, am I really being a disciple of God or am I just kind of at work for him? And we all know this in ministry. It's so easy to get to that other side. And so this really calls out Let's make sure we're really rooted in Christ as we're doing our ministry. So good. And um, I actually uh, was reminded when I was reading about the personal health side of one of my colleagues, Chris, mm -hmm. on the leader team. And he, inside of our leader tool, he actually has a goal that every single, he has a goal and a recurring topic in his leader agenda with his boss that's specifically mm -hmm. about personal health. And so I wanted to show it to you guys. He was nice enough to let me, uh, I was like, hey, can you take a screenshot of your, <laughs> your leader <laughs> agenda? And so this is my colleague, Chris, when he's meeting with his boss, Jeremy, who's our director of sales here, every single time they meet and they're one-on-one -on -one each week, First of all, you'll see uh, Chris has a goal. I mean, it's a literal goal around his weekly Sabbath. And that is just so impactful to me. Every time I see this in his leader agenda, it really causes me to look in the mirror and say, wow, how am I resting mm -hmm. so that I can really care for my health? And then that impacts my team as well. And then the other thing that I love about their agenda is when Chris started at Leader, um, he told Jeremy, hey, I've done three startups before. I know that it's going to be a lot of work, but I really want to prioritize my personal health and the health of my family. And so every single week that they meet, he and Jeremy talk about how well are you continuing to prioritize family and health amidst the pace and expectations at work. Mm. And so I just loved the intentionality here that um, Chris, and then we're looking at his boss, Jeremy, that they're talking about this on a weekly basis. And so I think sometimes as leaders, we we say like, 
you know, yeah, Chris, uh, be healthy, take care of that on your own outside of work hours, but really it infiltrates our work life too. And so for us as leaders to be checking in regularly with our team on how are you prioritizing your health this week so that you can be your best for your family, for yourself and for your team. Mm -hmm. So I love that. Well, it's a really good point because we just ran um, a report on all the people who have taken the unstuck teams assessment so far and the two areas in personal health that came out the lowest was I take Sabbath, I practice Sabbath, and I take good care of my body, you know, my physical health. Both of those were the lowest in those areas. And in fact, of all 72 questions on the assessment, taking Sabbath was number 71 as far as ranking. So this is a real issue. And it's kind of ironic, right? Because it's in the church world. Yes. Um, Like it's one of the 10 commandments. (laughs) I know. And I've heard you, I've heard our pastors preach on this, um, but we clearly have not been practicing what we preach. So I always encourage, you know, if I had any action in this point, if that's you, as you're listening to this is to just value that Sabbath. Um, I often see it as an issue of trust, at least in my own life, Holly, you know, do I trust God enough to put down the work for 24 hours? Do I believe that I'm going to do everything that I can do and then trust that God will do what only he can do? I I often think it's just better in his hands anyways. Um, But I love that it's on leader in that checklist. I was just doing a podcast with Tony today and he has lights that are set on timers and he has one day a week where his lights do not turn on in his office. And it just serves as a reminder. This is the day that's set aside so that we can really keep our health by practicing the Sabbath. That is so good. So good. Man, we could do a whole webinar just on that because I know Mm -hmm. there's a lot of research out there where um, a lot of churches aren't even offering, they don't even have a sabbatical in their employee handbook or policy. And um, so it's just so important that we, that we reprioritize our personal health, especially Mm -hmm. in ministry for sure. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, the second component of a high impact team is team health. So um, talk to us about team health and how this is different from personal health. Sure. Well, team health is all about what happens when healthy people serve on a team together and teams strong in this area experience an environment where people demonstrate the ability and willingness to resolve conflict within the team, resolve it the right way, right? Where we talk to one another versus about one another. Um, When team health is high, it feels safe to give your honest opinion and to admit mistakes. In other words, you know, team members show vulnerability and openness, and we know that's so important in community with one another. And we see that people on the team encourage and affirm one another when team health is high. So that's a little description of that component. Yeah, that's so good. And I think the question here for everybody to think about is how does your team resolve conflict or does your team resolve conflict in a healthy way? And the key word here is healthy. Um, I think there's a, there's a lot of teams out there that don't ever even talk about conflict. They just kind of push everything under the rug. And that is just as unhealthy as handling conflict in a really unhealthy way. And uh, this is where I think the church in particular has a lot of room of improvement in Mm -hmm. really navigating, inviting conflict in a healthy Mm -hmm. way and navigating those conversations together. I will say, um, I think it's important to remember too, when be, be cognizant of different team members of maybe where they've come to your team from. If they've been at an unhealthy team that didn't resolve conflict well, they're going to bring that onto your team. And so for you as a leader to be able to work with them on that and through that and lead by example is huge in this. Mm-hmm. So how maybe, can, teams- can I just share? Can I just share? Yeah, yeah. We, we, we did the, unstu- again, when we looked at the assessment and analyzed all the data that came from that. One of the biggest gaps um, in team health is all about having genuine times of prayer together and being in God's word together. And I get it. It's so easy to feel like, well, we pray at our meetings or we, you know, we, we do this. I don't know how to wed. I don't know how to make it genuine. It feels like it's wedged in, but I would just encourage you to consider how can you bring reading God's word and, and bringing prayer into the work that the team does again, quoting Lance Witt. He often says, Um, Spiritual disciplines aren't an individual support, just an individual support. They're also a team sport. So I just heard him recently in our master class. He gave some ideas and I just wanted to share them with our listeners. You know, one is to simply just open the word together. You know, open the word and read a few pieces of scripture. Sit there as a team for a little bit, talk about it. Really easy to do. Just let God speak through that. 
Another thing he recommends is the daily office. It's by Pete Scazzaro's Day by Day. And it's this practice of just slowing down to meet God throughout the day. And if you Google that, you can find some resources on it. Um, how about fasting? You know, when the team is taking a hill together, what if we all fasted together to see what God might do through that spiritual discipline? And then another easy one, read a book together. But instead of like, you know, a book on leadership or things that leaders naturally gravitate towards, maybe read a book together that really feeds the soul and then discuss it, you know, take a few minutes to discuss it each week so that we keep that value high and hot in our teams is this, this idea of team health. That's so good. And if you're wondering, you know, I don't even know how my team is doing, right? Then mm -hmm. um, I would encourage you to check out, we're going to have a link at the very end of today's webinar to the unstuck assessment. And that is a great place to start to just get a temperature check on how is your team doing? Because as leader, as executive leaders, we mm -hmm. are often the last to know. And so I think that's important for us to keep in mind from a team health standpoint. If we start to get a, hmm, that seems weird. That part of my team isn't doesn't seem to be healthy or working right. That means probably everybody else lower down on the org chart has been thinking that for a long time. Mm -hmm. And so it's really important that we prioritize that. And um, we'll be we'll put a link in the, the chat for you guys to be able to take um, the assessment for free with a, a, a code, a discount code. All right, so we've talked about personal health, we've talked about team health. Now let's talk about performance. So mm -hmm. personal mm -hmm. performance. Um, the question that I would love for you guys to be thinking about here is the difference between development and management. So here at Leader, we have a saying that people want to be led and developed, they do not want to be managed. So how <laughs> are you developing more than managing? And Amy, I know you have a lot to share about this. So I would love to hear your thoughts on personal management, or sorry, personal performance, and as it relates well, to management and development. Yeah, this is where a lot of leaders lean in. All right, let's talk about performance, personal performance, Get team performance, <laughs> yeah. right? But when we assess this area of personal performance, what we're really looking at are just fundamental things like, do people really know what the win is for their role? It seems really basic, but you know, when we did our staffing and structure, when I first started with the Unstuck group, part of the process was I would go out and I would actually interview a handful, 10, 12 employees, and just ask them a series of questions to kind of get to understand what the team was like. And I would often say, what, what does the win look like for your role? How do you know if you're doing the job that you should be doing? And most often they would smile and they go, hmm, that's a really good question. I'm not kidding, 90% of the time. So yes. being clear about that is important when it comes to personal performance. We also look at their role. You know, does it align with their gifting and their passions? And do people feel empowered to carry out their role? And then I like what you put in that quote, that development piece, you know, are they learning and growing and getting better at what they do? And is there like this intentional plan for their development? Again, we don't have to over-engineer this, but we lead, people who work on teams love to have a leader that's helping them think through, how can I develop? How can I get better? And then do they connect with their supervisor regularly? you know, where they receive feedback on what they're doing well and on the areas they need to be working on. So for all, for people to be high performing, these are the foundational things that just need to be in place on any team. Mm -hmm. It's so good. Um, and what you said about connecting with their supervisor or their manager on a regular basis, this is huge. We're going to talk about this a little bit later, but we are big on the one-on-one -on -one meeting um, mm -hmm. when it comes to personal performance for sure. Well, how can teams move from the vision of this? Like, yes, I want to help each team member be a high personal performer mm -hmm. to actually moving into action on this. Yeah, you're, you're leading us right there. The biggest gap we see in this area of personal performance is around performance management and development. And for the most part, people feel like their role you know, aligns with their passions and they feel like they're striving to get better and better at what they do. But what they lack is effective feedback from their leader and a plan for development. And by the way, I get that. Um, I think performance management systems kind of come into two camps. One is completely under-engineered. And that's the annual performance review, right? We're working together all year long and all of a sudden, oh no, it's time for the annual performance review. And now I feel get feedback from these people. And anyways, it's like this big event once a year. And of mm -hmm. course we know that doesn't help us lead or manage or do our job any better. The other mm -hmm. camp is this over-engineered one. And that's where, you know, teams like fill out a weekly form, report what you were doing, what did you get done? And again, 
we may have a paper trail. We may have a lot of, you know, activity around performance management, but management is really not being coached. And so the action that I would say is set up effective one-on-ones, you know, meet at least bi-monthly with your team members, have meaningful, timely, regular conversations. And these conversations, they're not all about business, if I can say it that way. Part Mm -hmm. of this time is to get to know your team member, know their family, understand their world, pray for them. Tony often says, he's my boss. He'll often say, if I don't know how to pray for you and your family, I'm not being a good leader. And I just, I, I appreciate that so much. And at the same time, these one-on-ones are not all relational. You need to talk about their priorities and you need to know how you're doing. Let them know how they're doing related to action on those priorities. We want to give honest feedback and we want to give honest encouragement, right? You know, and I would tell every leader when you're having these meetings, don't just sit there, you know, take notes, grab a pen, write it down so that you can remember the next time you meet where you were the last time you talked. Do you agree with that, Holly? Oh my goodness. I just want to like stand up and, you know, yeah, sing a song and <laughs> of agreement. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, Cause that one-on-one meeting, that is really where we see the power of transformation happen mm-hmm. on teams is through that intentional time. And that's where, if you are the executive leader, I agree, we've got probably two different types of people watching today. We've probably got that internal champion. That's like, I love having one-on-ones with my boss, but they never show up for them or they cancel them all the time. Right. And Mm -hmm. really yearn for that time. And then we've also probably got our executive leaders on the team. And so if you're the executive leader, please know that just having that intentional one-on-one on on your calendar, at least on a biweekly basis, just speaks volumes to your care and development of your, Mm -hmm. your teammates. And they really desire and value that time with you. Um, sometimes I think leaders need to be told that it's like, oh, wow. Okay. I'm not bothering them. They actually want to spend time with Mm -hmm. me and know that they're winning. So Holly, um, you and I might disagree on this and I think that's okay if we do, but I, you know, I find a lot of, uh, pastors and leaders that I work with, they're meeting with their team members once a week. And that's Mm -hmm. just a lot of time. And I often wonder, is it really necessary? I think it is when people are new to the team, but I wouldn't default to a weekly meeting. It, It can be overkill. And then we actually aren't being strategic about those meeting times, right? We're just kind of, I don't mind a check-in, right? Drive by, manage by walking around. But I think if anyone on your team needs a weekly meeting with you that they've been on the team five years, you might have the wrong leader if that's the case. Right, not enough um, strategy and intentionality. Yeah, Mm -hmm. we we recommend bi-weekly. I think it depends on the team. For, Mm -hmm. For me, I like to meet for 30 minutes a week with each of my team members, but I've got a small team, right? Right now for me, it's only two people that report to me. Now, Mm -hmm. if I had, you know, even five or more, that would be a lot. Um, Mm -hmm. So I think it really just depends on how fast the organization moves. There's a lot of different dynamics there, but at minimum, Mm -hmm. bi-weekly is what we love to see um, each of our customers be doing. So um, yeah, absolutely. All right. So personal performance. Well, next let's bring this all into the team, team Mm -hmm. performance. (laughs) So how well does your team get their work done? And I love this word that you put here, Amy, which is together. Mm -hmm. So talk to us about what team performance should look like. And I know you guys have a pyramid here that you walk a lot of your unstuck clients through. Yeah, of course, team performance is how well the team gets the work done. And and by the nature of the word team, it's how we get it done together. Not how well we love and care for one another, but it's an honest assessment around getting the right things done. And when we assess in this area with the unstuck teams assessment, we ask questions like, are your team's objectives and priorities clear? On the personal side, it's your priorities, right? But on this one, are the team objectives and priorities clear? And are Mm -hmm. we held accountable for our goals and our performance? Um, It's amazing, again, just like personal wins for my role, how fuzzy this can be for teams. Uh, In the church world, for example, I have a lot of churches who have events. In fact, I was just with the church this week and they have these women event, women's events, and I'm sure they're great. But I often ask the question, like, what's the win? If you hold this event, what's the win? Is it, is it just attendance that we, you know, brought a crowd and often churches will pause because we haven't taken that planning to the next level. I often, I give the example a lot. You know, if you have a marriage encounter or, you know, a speaker come in, and you know, you're hoping to fill the room, great, 800 people come to this, but then what? What's, what's the real result? And often it's things like, well, we really want people to get connected in our, our marriage small groups. Well, great, that's what you should actually 
be measuring. That's what I, that's what I mean when I say, what are, what are the real objectives and the real priorities? Because any church can gra- gather a crowd, but are they helping them really take next steps towards Jesus? Um, anyways, we also mm-hmm. assess, are we clear on who makes decisions? Do we have this collaborative mindset? Are we taking the hill together or are we just focused on our own ministry area? Are we pulling in the same direction, et cetera? And so I just thought I'd share, this is a familiar, um, a familiar visual if you've been around the unstuck group to, uh, for very long. Just one second, I don't multitask well, share my screen. But what I'm really getting at when I talk about team performance is this directional level for churches, especially. I mean, this could apply to any organization. But the stuff down here, what we believe, why we exist, and who we want people to be becoming to look like Jesus really doesn't change. But for teams to really have a high performing team, we need clarity about where we're going over the next three to five years. We need to know what success looks like in the form of organizational goals every year. So we should be setting, if we do what God wants us to do through our body of Christ here, what does success look like? And then we ask the question, how will we get it done? We have to have this level defined before we start to tell teams really what their ministry priorities are. So you can see if we're missing this, if we just have our mission, but we have no goals, everyone's going to make up their own priorities. In fact, Tony often draws it like this. We're just going to have a bunch of little floating, you know, disconnected, siloed ministries up here doing their own thing. But the goal is to keep all of this unified as we as we work through it. But we can't miss this this phase of understanding what success looks like, how we're going to accomplish it so that ministries understand their priorities. So that's really the kicker for me when I think about this area of team performance. As leaders of the organization, are we being clear about those things so that teams understand what their priorities are and they're held accountable to it in a good way? Yes, absolutely. It's so powerful um, for sure, because the key word there is, I think, together. It's not We're not doing work in Mm -hmm. silos. We're not having a bunch of just individual contributors that are only thinking about themselves. It's that togetherness where we really see, um, that's where we see our missions accomplished and that pyramid, just such a good visual for that. Um, well, any last uh, advice before we move on to our, our next component of how we can move this into action? No, I would just say, um, you want it. You really want to lean in on the planning. If you feel like the team is underperforming, Um, You need to get back to understanding what God's called you to do, make that clear for the organization, because that's the foundational work that needs to be done by leadership in order for the team to actually be high performing. So good. My favorite word, alignment. (laughs) So Mm -hmm. good. It is a good word. (laughs) All right. So we've talked about health, both individual and team. We've talked about performance, both individual and team. Now we're going to move on to our systems and processes. So Mm. the fifth out of the six components of a high impact team is our organizational systems. So I would encourage you, if you're watching, to ask yourself, are our systems working for us or against us? Are they aligned with our value? When we say we're an agile team, do our systems match that? Or do we have systems that work against that? So talk to us about organizational systems, Amy, because I know this is one of your real areas of expertise. Oh, yeah. Well, these are the systems, you know, that we as leaders design to support the ministry we do. So these are systems like how we hire and onboard, um, how we make clear the reporting structure and who does what on the team, our communication system, specifically, you know, Holly, how we communicate internally. As we mentioned earlier, performance management systems, our financial systems, benefits and pay, project task management, and meetings, right? Meetings are part of our systems as well. And I know that church people, we love our meetings. Um, But as an organization, we need healthy and clear systems in order to be healthy and high performing as a team. So that's why this one made it on one of the six components. Yes, it's so critical. And I think this is where we have a lot of um, of trouble as ministry leaders because Sunday comes every week. And so we want to get better at our systems and processes. We want to have better hiring and onboarding systems and processes, but it's so hard to do that when we've got Sunday to plan for every Mm -hmm. single week. And so we here at Leader, when we were going out to say, okay, we know there's a problem here with people development, but what exactly is the problem? So we did a bunch of research. We had phone interviews with a lot of different organizations. And what we found was these six issues are the most common that stand in the way. 
And to your point, Amy, the loudest that we hear over and over again, almost every single call I'm on when we're talking about leader is the lack of consistent structure and framework for development. Mm -hmm. And really that one, I would say one in three really um, often are foundations for the other four. Uh, when we don't have systems and processes in place, that's where tyranny the urgent can take over and railroad <laughs> our, our mission. And then that makes two, four, five, and six that much harder. I know a lot of organizations are really struggling with five and six right now. I heard a stat the other day that 40% of, um, of people are actively looking for a new job. So four out of 10 people on your team are, are likely applying elsewhere or at least thinking about it. And so that's why we've really got to get this right and provide systems and processes, not just for the sake of systems and processes. It should never be processes over people. It should be people over processes, but our processes should support our people development so that they can do what only they can do in achieving our mission. So I'm going to provide some solutions to these problems in our next section, but I just wanted to affirm what you're saying, Amy, and why mm -hmm. it's so important because we see it every day at Leader as well. Mm -hmm. It's really good. Yeah. And I know, um, Amy, you have a story that I've heard you tell before about when you were at 3M um, mm -hmm. specifically on this. So I would love for everybody else to hear that today as well. Well, you know, I get passionate about the subject of meetings because we spend so much time in meetings. And when meetings are done well, you know, they're, they're critical to us getting the right work done because we get the right intersections of people. And that's where we get the work done a lot in churches. We, we intersect with one another. Um, but yeah, many moons ago, I worked at um, 3M and the joke was that 3M stood for meetings, meetings and more meetings. And <laughs> again, I've heard Lance Witt say there's an old saying that if you want to kill time, a meeting is a perfect uh, weapon. And there's so some truth good. in that. Um, yep. But bad, bad meetings aren't good. Bad meetings are a waste of our time. And some of the data that we've seen, uh, you know, most professionals, they attend a total of 62 meetings a month, which is about 14 meetings oh. per week. And here's the kicker though, professionals lose 31 hours a month in unproductive meetings. That's roughly four work days a month that we lose in bad meetings. Unbelievable. Um, and, yeah, in one study, I think it was 73% um, said that they brought other work to meetings and 39% said they fall asleep during you know, meetings. Oh my so goodness. eventually that might kill collaboration within your team. And there's not enough time to cover how to have an effective meeting, but if it's all right, just a shout out to the Unstuck podcast. We just talked yes. about this a while ago. It's episode 192. And in the show notes for that podcast, we actually give you kind of a roadmap for how to ensure that you have an effective meeting, some of the, the guardrails to make sure you're, you're maximizing those meetings. So that's awesome. So that's, yeah. I just put that in the chat. So episode 192, go check it out. We are super passionate about effective meetings here at Leader as well. So um, absolutely. I haven't listened to that one yet, Amy. So I need to go go listen to that um, and take some notes. It's good. I probably told the 3M story there. So yeah. <laughs> we're getting a sneak peek. So it's yeah. good. All right. Well, um, we are about to cover the last component of the six for a high impact team. So please remember to put in any questions you have. I've got one here from Randy. That's awesome that we'll be able to talk about here in a second. Um, but we invite you. We're going to have plenty of time for Q&A. So bring it on. All right, Amy. So the last component is culture. I love this quote by Sam Chan. Toxic culture is like carbon monoxide. You don't see it or smell it, but you wake <laughs> up dead. Super dramatic, but so, so true. Good. Yes. So talk to us about culture. I think even defining culture would be helpful because it's a buzzword. We hear it a lot, but what do we even mean when we say that? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know if I have an answer for that, but let me just maybe approach it a different way. If you want to reduce turnover, you have to pay attention to culture. If you want to raise the satisfaction level on your team, you have to pay attention to culture. If you want to get everyone rowing in the same direction, pay attention to culture. Greater sense of team, attracting the right people, minimize sideways energy and dysfunction, build a healthy and high performing team. Culture is right in the core of all of that. And I know there's a lot of different ways that people define culture, but I'll just tell you what we do when we coach churches on this topic. You know, when I step into a church and work with a team, I can just sense their culture. I can sense they're wired certain ways. By the way, often culture takes the cues from the top four or five leaders. 
but they have different personalities organizationally. Um, so we coach churches um, to help articulate and define the four to six distinctive behaviors that define who fits here and who doesn't fit here. And again, each team defines these differently, but when those are in place, we find that teams then know who to add to their team and they know who to remove from their team. And it brings this life-giving atmosphere to the team. I'll give you an example from the Unstuck group. A couple of ours, one, we're mission-minded. And it's, it's just, I mean, that's maybe not so distinctive, but as we talk it out, we understand, like we are all rooted in the mission of helping churches get unstuck. It's what we bleed, it's what we live, whether we're at home or at work or whatnot. And another one is this value of improvement. Um, we are constantly trying to understand how do we, what do we have to change in order to continue to serve our churches in the best possible way? So if we had someone on our team who got paralyzed every time we made a change, if we had someone on the team who was like, you know, we have to have every T crossed, I dotted, like we eventually get there, but we're not going to let, you know, the pressure for perfection hold us back from creating new things that need to happen. There's an adaptability there. And so I say they're distinctive because they really do. They help you understand who fits here and who doesn't. And teams that really articulate this, we just, we see them get traction because, mm -hmm. it, and by the way, it's not the permission to play. Like if you wrote down, we read our Bible, there's nothing too distinctive that you can tie to that. Because hopefully if you're leading a church, we all read the Bible and we pray. We're talking about how we behave as team members on this team. Yep, you nailed it, Amy. I was going to say the, the definition of culture is shared values and beliefs. And sometimes I think we overthink this, this thing called culture because we hear about how important it is and it feels like this nebulous idea. Like, how do we actually put that into action? And it's mm -hmm. what are your shared values and beliefs? But here's the thing. If you don't take the time to define them, they're going to be defined anyway. Like, cause your team mm -hmm. is going to inherently have shared values and beliefs, whether you like it or not. And so mm -hmm. if you're, if you take the time to define them and name them and infuse them into your organization and hire, like to your point, make sure you're mm -hmm. hiring with your values in mind, um, that is your culture. That's how you create and protect mm -hmm. um, your culture. So, and how so, we often and, say, don't don't put aspirational behaviors there. You know, if yeah. you're like, this is a dumb one. We're hardworking. You know, mm -hmm. if, if you're not, don't put it. You know, or you know, we is more important than me. If that's not true, don't put it on there. You want these to be true behaviors about your team, not aspirational ones or throwaway ones. So good. So good. Um, and one, another thing too, that I wanted to share around this idea of culture, because I, again, I think it can be an overwhelming concept, especially if you don't have your values as an organization, your mission or your values that were on the very bottom of the pyramid that you shared. That's the first place to start is getting clear on who you are, what you believe um, so that you can start defining your culture. But as we think about a high impact team of that health plus performance mm -hmm. at leader, we have five foundations. And so as we were doing all of our research and we saw those five problems that I just, or sorry, they were six problems that I just shared. We've said, okay, how do we solve this though? What are the shared values and beliefs of healthy organizations of high impact teams? And so for us, what we saw were these, these five continue to pop up over and over again. So the first, which we've talked about, because I know it's a passion for both of us, Amy, is that one-on-one -on -one meeting. And so we want to see every team member having a one-on-one -on -one meeting with their manager, at least on a bi-weekly basis. And then two, that every team member is recognized for their unique skills and strengths. I know it sounds simple, but there's a lot of, um, or of organizations that don't take the time to really say, okay, hey, how is this person uniquely wired? What are the gifts that God has given them and how can we help them grow and develop in those gifts? Third, receiving frequent feedback from their manager. You touched on that earlier in the performance section, Amy. It is critical that we have organizations that have healthy feedback cultures. Otherwise, we're just gonna stay stagnant and not be able to grow if we don't receive feedback. And then clearly documented goals. This reminds me of what you said a few minutes ago, which is, am I winning? Mm -hmm. uh, our um, executive chairman, Chris Heslip, every time he talks to us, so I have a one-on-one -on -one with him um, every other week, and he always says, okay, Holly, are you winning? And if I can't answer yes or no, I know I have work to do on my goals, because mm -hmm. if my goals aren't clear, I don't know if I'm winning, right? Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> and then um, that we each have a personalized growth and development plan. And so I would encourage you to write these down, regardless of whether you use software or a workbook or a journal. Mm -hmm. Of course, we would love for you to use our software because we feel like we've made it really effective for you to implement this, mm -hmm. but would love to see you think about how can you create a culture where these five foundations are a part of your rhythms um, as you engage and grow every member of, of your team. So I don't know if you had anything to add to that, Amy, as you look at these five foundations. I know you work with a lot of organizations that are in from all different um, spectrums of the health spectrum, from healthy to unhealthy. <laughs> yeah, no, those are excellent. I love number three there, getting frequent feedback. I kind of have, I've say this a lot, but what gets noticed gets repeated and mm -hmm. that managers get what they tolerate. And so I just think it's so good and fun to catch people doing the right things and calling it out, whether how they're wired publicly or privately, but that whole management by walking around, you can never underestimate how far that goes when people get caught doing the right things, how much they wanna do it again. So, so good, so true. Um, and this is just another, just to further say it, because I've said it a million times, one-on-one -on -one meetings, we believe that that is the most powerful leadership development tool that you have. So if you don't do anything else after this, but hope that you um, start to have regular one-on-one -on -one intentional meetings with your team. All right, let's jump into some next steps. Uh, Randy, you get the gold star. We've got two questions from Randy already. Um, anybody else that's joining us today, feel free to pop your question in there because we're going to open it up to Q&A. Um, but we've got two steps for you. So one is from the leader team and one is from the unstuck team. From the leader team, would encourage you if you're not, I know we've got several customers already um, on the call today, but if you have not yet seen a demo, we would invite you to go to our website, leader.com, or you can email me, holly.tate at leader.com, and we'll set up a custom demo for you to see leader in action so you can implement all the things you've seen today inside your um, organization. Um, we help with leadership development, core HR, all that back of house stuff. We want to make it easier for you to spend less time in paperwork and more time with your people when it comes to HR and then also health plans so you can better care for and develop your team. And then from the unstuck group, they are offering an incredible resource to you. It is their high impact teams assessment. So um, it is free for you today if you use this code. It's leader. We, we don't know how to spell here at leader. So you just leave the last E out, <laughs> L-E-A-D-R. We've already had se several customers take advantage of this and love it. It is um, so, so good. Thank you, Amy and Tiffany. I know mm -hmm. who's on the call for putting this together. Amy, can you tell a little bit about what they, the results that they see when they take the assessment? Yeah, you bet. So with the high impact team, high impact teams assessment, um, we would have as many of your team members that can take this assessment with you, and then you'll get a report back that gives you a score in each of those six areas. So you can see where your team currently has strength and where there are some areas that you want to get better at. And by the way, it's very simple visually as you look at these scores. And one of the unique things about the high impact teams is we also include a final question that says, how likely is it that you would recommend to a friend or colleague to come and work for this team? And the reason that's really important, it's a net promoter score. It's a, it's a industry sta industry standard, but you might have like sixes and sevens and feel like, okay. And then that net promoter score can be really low and it just awakens you to, okay, we don't want to be mediocre. We need to be able to get better. Or I just worked with the church this week. Their scores were phenomenal and it was so good to celebrate with them and they can take it to their team. But what this serves as in my, you know, the first time you take it is like this baseline. And then understanding what do we need to celebrate because we're getting it right. And then what are the areas, the opportunities we have to get a little bit better. And then this is something I would hope people would take every year just to kind of inspect, are we continuing to make progress in being a healthy and high performing team? So good. So there you go. Go to the unstuckgroup.com slash leader, use the code leader, and you'll get to take that assessment for free. And I know the unstuck team would love to walk you through that so you can understand those results and uh, how do we continue to engage and grow our team. All right, well, let's jump into some questions, Amy. We've got sure. two from Randy, one for Tiffany. So let's start. This is really good from and, uh, from Randy. He says he's heard different definitions of taking personal Sabbath. He said, I'm not asking for a whole webinar, <laughs> just some helpful tips to get my team members moving in the right direction on this. So what are you seeing, Amy, as you're working with churches across the country? 
I would just start by saying a simple definition is 24 hour period that's set aside where you're not working so that you have time to replenish your soul. You know, it's a day that's just set aside to, and just don't do anything that you don't want to do. Now I know there's some have to's in parenting, keep feeding your kids, but just the day <laughs> where the work is set down. Um, one of the things that uh, Lance Witt coached all of us on, he gave us all Sabbath candles. And unlike Tony, who turned his lights off for the day, Lance encouraged us to light a candle for the day to kind of just identify this is the day that's set aside. And then as the leaders do that, you talk about practical next steps, I think, for your team. I think it's good to just hold the value high and then inspect on it. Uh, for example, there's a fire poem that Lance pulled together for all of us and just got all of us together. And it, we had a discussion around the logs in a fire. The reason a fire burns hot is because there's logs and there's space between the logs. And if we just threw all the logs on there, all the work, right, we wouldn't have the fire we want. So he teed it up, the great, great all staff activity, and then ask your team if they're doing it. I remember Tony in the midst of the pandemic just paused and said, you guys have all been working really hard. I want y'all to take a week off in the next four weeks, clear your calendar, and then he'll ask sometimes, you know, how are we doing uh, around those things of the Sabbath? When leaders ask their team members questions like that, you know, where's your next finish line? Are you taking your Sabbath? They almost feel permission then to actually do that. So Randy, there's a couple of ideas on how you can maybe take that forward. Absolutely. And I think even, you know, again, it starts at the top. So even by leading and sharing with your team, hey, I'm trying to take a Sabbath and here's how I'm thinking about it. You know, here's um, here's some different things I'm going to do on my Sabbath or things I'm going to turn mm -hmm. off or don't expect to hear from me on this day. Mm -hmm. um, Cause I know a lot of us think as the Sabbath is Sunday, but for ministry leaders, that's gotta be a different day in the week because they're working Most likely. on Sunday. Mm -hmm. so, so good, Amy. All right. Uh, Randy also said, so on the slide of what stands in the way, any insights when your ministry doesn't have many positions for people to advance to, this is a great question. As I develop people, it seems like I am helping them get their next job somewhere else. Mm. Um, and that I would love to hear your thoughts on this, Amy. I've got a couple of thoughts, but um, you spend a lot of time in the staffing and structure part of mm -hmm. um, the unstuck assessment. So I would love to hear your thoughts on this. Yeah, I just need perspective. Uh, the slide that said what stands in the way, what was that referring to? Yeah, so the six, um, it was the six problems um, of okay. what stands in the way. And okay. um, like tyranny of the urgent, generational oh, gap. Gotcha. Yeah. Sorry about that. Oh, um, no, you're okay. Well, why don't you go first, Holly, if you've got some ideas and I'll, I'll noodle on it while you're answering. Yeah. So I think that there are a couple of generational differences here. So, and from what I'm seeing across, you know, this is the first time that we've ever had five generations in the workforce, which is just wild to think about, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. I had a moment for myself. So I'm a millennial. I'll be 33 later this year. And I had a moment this summer where I realized I'm not the young one anymore because I was having a one-on-one -on -one with a uh, generation Z, a newer member of our team. And it was, I mean, our perspectives were just so different. And I had this moment where I was like, I've got work to do to understand this next generation because they are, even though, you know, years wise, we're not that different, right? But generationally and how we were raised, so different. So mm -hmm. one of the things I'm seeing is that title is less important for the younger generations, but responsibility is critical. So I surveyed a lot of our um, Generation Z team at Leader because um, I was trying to understand how are they different? How are they wired different? And one of the things I heard over and over again was when I get more responsibility from my boss, I feel trusted. And there's that trust word that we talked about earlier, Amy. Mm -hmm. So Randy, I would encourage you to think about it less of like titles and um, maybe even the size of their team and more about responsibility and influence. So what are some projects that you can give and, and make a big deal about it to say, hey, Here's a problem that I'm seeing that I would love to get your perspective on. So here's a responsibility that I want you to own and see how they do. And so they can advance in responsibility more than necessarily a title or a position or a place on the org chart. So that's just one practical idea to think about. What do you think, Amy? I think the only other thing that comes to mind is when we think about developing people, it's really starting a conversation with them to ask them how they what they want to be developed in and to ask them, what are the things that you want to be exposed to? I was just looking for one that I just worked with someone on. It's that conversation of how do you hope to grow and develop this year? 
Um, so. And giving them time to think about it, by the way. And then you as a leader processing that and thinking through, all right, what's their development thought this year? What's scripture that goes with that? What are some experiences that I could maybe introduce them into to meet that development need? But we don't, as leaders, don't always have the, sometimes we know where they need to develop. Okay. So that's <laughs> good. If we know that one, we bring that in. But sometimes just asking that question might really help them, again, feel valued. And Holly, I agree with you on that. People love to be challenged and stretched. In Absolutely. A safe way, right. Mm -hmm. And I'm currently working. It's almost done. We're hoping to have it done next week, Randy. If you want to email me, um, I'll put my email in the chat, but we're working on a personalized, it's a, a how-to guide to build a leadership development program in your organization. And it's a lot of what you're talking about, Amy. It's a collaborative process, a five-month period. Um, and so we'll have that as a template that you can use for your team, Randy, hopefully next week. <laughs> so be on the lookout mm -hmm. for that. But I just want to commend you too, Randy, because I love that you're even thinking about developing your people because either way, I think it's a stewardship issue, right? Like we, it is our responsibility to steward the people that God has entrusted within our influence or whether they stay at our organizations for years and years, or they move on to somewhere else. At least hopefully the goal is that they'll leave better leaders than when they came in. And I know it can be hard when we see them move on to the next thing, but just know that you're doing the right thing by developing them when they're um, in your sphere of influence. So, so good. All right, Amy. So Tiffany um, asked, I've heard differing opinions on one-on-ones. Some leaders say that the employee should drive the conversation and others say that the manager should. What's your position and are there pros and cons to each approach? The answer to your question is yes, both. <laughs> and that's where I talked about that resource on there, but there's definitely some things that need to be driven by the leader like the personal check-in time, ask questions about this person, not this employee, but this person, um, encouraging and offering um, feedback, you know, to affirm things that are going well, those are driven. Um, when it comes to what the employee needs to bring though, when they understand their priorities, bringing those updates and sharing what's going well and what's not and what feels stuck and, you know, the things that they might need from their manager um, are important to be driven by the employee. And then the manager should always have a few things that they want to cover with their employee. And then there's some mutual pieces, which let's agree on what's most important. What are the action steps? Let's close this thing in prayer together. So I think it really is both. And that's why I think even starting from a resource from uh, what I mentioned in episode 192. Oh, that was a different one. That's not effective one-on-ones. Um, anyways, the when meetings. you share yeah. that, yeah, but when you share that and you talk through um, what the leader needs to bring, what the employee needs to bring. And that's a standard kind of roadmap that you go through once or twice a month on the formal review is I think the best way to do it. Yep, absolutely. And that's why I love using a tool because it can be collaborative. Mm -hmm. So, um, cause what you don't want to happen is you both get to the meeting and one, neither of you know what each other are bringing. And so then mm -hmm. it's really ineffective because no one's been able to prepare based on what they've, what they're mm -hmm. expecting from the other person. Um, and then, uh, and then two, it just can, one person can, can dominate. And so when it's collaborative and you can see that agenda ahead of time and be able to add things throughout the week, um, that's where we see them get really mm -hmm. powerful. All right. One last question. Chip says when people share goals that are outside the team's focus, how do you coach them back towards the team goals, particularly when they are resistant focus mm -hmm. and alignment? I love it. What do you think, Amy? Well, as the manager, you are the one who is responsible to bring clear clarity to what the goals are and the priorities of the team. And if they make up some other ones, really, you're holding them accountable to the team ones, and that's what they're going to be assessed on. And so you really hold the upper hand in that. Um, I had a church, for example, you know, they had all these goals around what a campus pastor needs to do about helping people take next steps in groups and serving well, this the campus pastor had kind of a side hustle on the things they wanted. He wanted his people to be doing, and they've had to work hard to go. That's not a bad thing. By the way, there's hardly any ministry idea that's a bad thing, but it's not the most important thing. And th this is what success looks like for your role. And these are the goals we need you to hit. So good. And Chip, I would just say to um, keep it front and center. So a lot of times goals are set and forget. We do all this work around goals. We, you know, a lot of, I see a lot of churches at the beginning of the year, they put them up, they've got them real clear, but then they never bring them back up again. And that's where I think you can see that drift happen when it's not front and center. So in those one-on-ones, 
uh, make sure that it's front and center so that you're reminded each and every week um, of what you're working towards so you don't get mm -hmm. that mission drift. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for coming today. Hope this was helpful. Please feel free to reach out to the leader team or unstuck team. This is what uh, gets us excited and gets us out of bed <laughs> every single day. <laughs> Support you in growing and developing your teams. Amy, thank you for your investment into today and providing this amazing resource for everyone that joined. We so appreciate you and the entire unstuck group team. Thanks for inviting us. Have a great day. Bye, everybody.